Hello everyone, how's it going? My name is Dan the Tutor. For those of you taking Physics 202 at the University of Delaware, this video is for you. This is from graded exercise number two, problem two. Of course, I'm not gonna do the actual question for academic integrity purposes, but I'm gonna do one just like it and we'll talk about the strategies involved. And so you can use this question to help solve the one on your paper. So first off, let's say I have a cylinder, a hollow cylinder, and it's going to kind of look like a paper towel roll, if you think of it like that. And through the middle of my paper towel roll, I have a straight line of charge. So this hollow cylinder here, this is a conductor, but it has no charge on the conductor itself. The line of charge, on the other hand, will have a charge. We'll say it has a linear charge density of negative four microcoulombs per meter. And again, the conductor itself has no charge. So what we want to do for this problem is determine the electric field at three points. Let's say one point in the middle of the conducting sphere, another point inside of the conducting sphere or cylinder, and then one point outside way over here. And I'll label these points one, two, and three. Let's say the inner radius is three centimeters, and I'll give an outer radius for my cylinder of 10 centimeters. The cylinder itself is essentially infinitely long, same with the wire, and I want to solve for the electric field at points one, two, and three. So the way you're gonna find electric field for this one, there's only one way to do it, as far as I know, and it's Gauss's law. And Gauss's law follows an equation that says the electric flux, which I'll get into more in a minute, is equal to the charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught, which is a constant that's 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12th. And that symbol there, Greek letter phi, is known as electric flux, and it's equal to the electric field times our area. There's also technically a cosine theta in this equation, but I'm going to be ignoring it because I'm gonna choose values that just turn cosine theta into one anyway, so it doesn't matter. So essentially we have this equation, E times A, the area, is equal to Q enclosed, which I'll explain more in a minute, over epsilon naught. And I wanna be solving for E, my electric field. Now let's explain Gauss's law with a very, very simple problem. Let's say I have a charge here, I'll say it's plus three coulombs, and then I put a Gaussian surface around it. What's a Gaussian surface? A Gaussian surface is an imaginary, which is why I drew dotted lines, it's an imaginary surface that we are going to use for all of our equations. Now technically the shape can be whatever you want, for instance, it can be a square, it can be a rhombus, it can be a kite, it can be a trapezoid, it doesn't matter. But I'll tell you, if it was a point source of charge, like I have here with this plus three coulombs, it's always gonna be easiest to choose the circle. That's just gonna be the easiest, I promise. And so let me be very clear, this is actually existing in 3D space, which means it's actually a sphere, it's not a circle. And the reason that's important is because most of the time we use Gauss's law problem, or how we know we should use Gauss's law in the first place, is almost always because it's a 3D object. If it's 2D for electric field, then we're probably just using this equation, E equals K, Q over R squared. And again, we typically use that for a 2D problem, but this is clearly 3D based on the picture. So back to Gauss's law, what I'm saying is the charge enclosed in this example that I just made up would be three coulombs. And then we know the surface area of a sphere is four pi r squared. And I say we know that because I know that and none of my students do. So you can just Google that and now you can say we know it. And then you can use that to solve for the electric field. Now in this example, it's a lot trickier in the actual example we have here because we see that there's a lot more going on than just a dot. But the concept remains the same. In other words, the first thing I need to do is draw my Gaussian surface and I'm also gonna focus on point one here first. Remember that, let me zoom in. Remember that point one is inside of the cylinder itself, which means that the conductor is not gonna have any impact on point one at all. So in other words, when I redraw the picture, I'm only gonna draw my line of charge. Again, with lambda equals negative four microcoulombs per meter. And now I'm gonna draw my Gaussian surface around this. Now keep in mind, Gaussian surfaces should always kind of match the object we're looking at. So in other words, when I had the dot of charge, then it made sense for my Gaussian surface to be a circle or a sphere. 
If I'm looking at a line of charge, well, the shape that would make the most sense for my Gaussian surface would be a cylinder. Now keep in mind, this cylinder is not the same as my paper towel shape from the problem. This is a surface that I'm making up and I know that the distance from here to here is the same as my distance to point one, which I forgot to say how far away points one, two, and three are. So let's say point one is one millimeter away. Point two is seven millimeters away. So in other words, it's in between the three and 10 inner and outer radius. And then point three just has to be some number greater than 10. So let's say 20 millimeters. So what I'm saying is back to my Gaussian surface, I'm saying if this is point one, which I'm saying it is, then this distance is one millimeter or 0 0.001 meters, which I always convert to meters for these problems in physics too. And now to find the electric field, it's as easy as saying flux is equal to charge enclosed over epsilon naught, or really flux is electric field E times area A equals Q enclosed times epsilon naught. And now here's where the problem gets pretty confusing for lack of a better word. So keep this in mind. Technically there's three fluxes that I should potentially worry about. One is the flux through this face of the cylinder. One is the flux through this face of the cylinder. And the third is the flux through the sides of my cylinder. Now for this example, I actually am only gonna care about the flux through the sides, not the two faces that I shaded in. And the reason for that is simple. When I have electric fields, remember that electric field lines point away from positive charges and towards negative charges. This wire is negatively charged as seen here with the negative linear charge density, which means all of the electric field lines wherever you're looking at always point towards the center. And none of the electric fields are pointing into or out of the sphere, I mean cylinder, because this wire is technically going on forever. So it wouldn't make sense for it to go parallel with that line. So in other words, what I'm saying is the area for this problem is really just the side of the cylinder. It's not the top or the bottom. And so I know the area of a cylinder. You probably don't. And let me just be clear. It's the surface area. It's not the volume, but that area right there is going to be two pi R times the height. And I don't know what the height of my Gaussian surface is. Remember it's the length of my cylinder I made up. So let's just say that this cylinder has length L. You can technically choose any value you want for L. You can choose 10 meters, 20 meters. It's going to cancel later on. That's just how these problems work. So I'll just call it L to prove that it will cancel out later in the problem. So that's my surface area. And I also know the radius is the distance from point one, which I'm saying is one millimeter or 0 0.001 meters for R. Again, that's times E. And then that's equal to the charge enclosed, which now I need an equation to find the charge enclosed. In other words, the charge inside of my blue cylinder. And there's only one way to find that. And that's by using lambda, the charge density, because lambda has its own equation. Lambda is equal to the charge over the distance, which in this case is L, because we're saying it's L long. So in other words, negative four times 10 to the minus sixth, and the 10 to the minus sixth is because it's micro, and micro is always 10 to the minus sixth, equals the charge, which is the charge enclosed, divided by L. Now, in order to plug it back into my equation right here, I need to solve this equation for charge enclosed, and I can just do that by multiplying both sides by L. So in other words, the charge enclosed is equal to negative four times 10 to the minus six times L. And then plugging that in here, I'm gonna get negative four times 10 to the minus six L divided by epsilon naught, and I'll plug in the numbers at the end. Oh, and one more thing, I'm going to erase this negative sign whenever I calculate electric field. And the reason I do that is because I already know the direction of electric fields based on the notation we use away from positive towards negative. So including the negative is just probably going to confuse me later on. So I just keep it positive for the math and then I determine the direction at the very end. So it looks like I have everything I need. I just need to divide both sides by two pi RL and that will be my value for E. So E is equal to four times 10 to the minus six times L divided by epsilon naught two pi RL. And like I said before, the L's cancel, which makes sense because I said they would. And if I just plug in my calculator, for all the values here, because four times 10 to the minus six, epsilon naught is a constant 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12th times two times pi, and then R is 0 0.001. I know I'm squeezing that in there, but I could care less about the actual answer. 
What I care about is the process, how we got there. So when I plug this in my calculator correctly, might I add, then I'll get an answer of E, the electric field, equals 7.19 times 10 to the seventh power. The units are newtons per coulomb. And now if we want to figure out the direction, x hat, y hat, z hat, we need to first talk about what my coordinate axes even are, which I probably should have started out sooner in the problem, but better late than ever. So what I'm saying is if we consider this dot right here as the center point, and I erase some of these arrows because this is starting to get confusing with all the arrows, that's better. So what I'm saying is to the right is considered the positive x hat direction, up is considered the positive y hat direction, and out of the page, so the direction of the wire itself, is considered the positive z hat direction. And if you look back at the original picture, point one is located just to the right of my center wire. And again, since electric field lines point towards the negative charge, that's the x direction, specifically the negative x direction, I'm going to make my electric field negative and put an x hat here. And that's how I know it's pointing to the left or the negative x hat direction. And there we go. There's our answer for the first one. Or if you want to write it in x hat, y hat, z hat notation, you can say E1 equals negative 7.19 times 10 to the seventh, comma zero, comma zero, because the y and the z direction components will be zero. So that's it for electric field one. Now for electric field two, I've got some good news. Electric field two is inside the conductor. And so when you're inside the conductor, there's a shortcut we're gonna use always, and that's that the electric field is always zero inside the conductor, always. So E2, zero, newtons per coulomb, done. That's it. It's inside the conductor, so the electric field is zero. As a matter of fact, the conductor really doesn't change anything for this problem. In other words, looking at one, one is inside the conductor, two is literally inside the conductor, and three is outside the conductor. We're gonna do the exact same process for number three, point three, as we did for number one. It literally, the conductor doesn't even change anything except point two, where it is zero. And again, that's because the conductor doesn't have any charge on it. All the charge is coming from the wire in the very center. So what I'm trying to get at here is, when I draw scenario three, I'm literally gonna draw the exact same picture I drew for number one, except maybe with a bigger Gaussian surface, a bigger cylinder. And I'm saying point three is somewhere over here. This radius or distance, whatever you wanna call it, is 20 millimeters which we know is 0 0.02 meters, because we need to convert. And again, I'm just ignoring my conductor. It, it doesn't matter at all. Once again, I'm gonna say the length of my Gaussian surface is just L at some distance. And the equation remains the same as well. Flux is equal to charge enclosed over epsilon naught, where the flux is equal to E times A, and the area is just two pi R L. That's all the same. Even charge enclosed remains the same. Remember how we solve for charge enclosed? Negative four times 10 to the negative six is equal to the charge over L, and then you multiply both sides by L. So once again, charge enclosed is gonna be, well, I'm not gonna write the negative because I typically don't write negatives, but four times 10 to the minus sixth times L divided by epsilon naught. This is exactly the same thing. As a matter of fact, the only thing that is gonna change between point one and point three is our radius. So in other words, when I solve for E, it's gonna be the exact same equation we had a little bit ago, divided by epsilon naught two pi R L. Again, L cancels, the radius this time is 0 0.02. And so when I plug this in my calculator, then I will get an electric field of 3.60 times 10 to the sixth. Again, it's Newtons per Coulomb. And for the same reason as last time, Electric field's gonna point towards the negative charge, and that is in the x hat direction. So it is negative and x hat. There's my answer for the third electric field. And again, if I wanna write it as x, y, z coordinates, then I can write negative 3.60 times 10 to the sixth, comma zero, comma zero, and that's also an acceptable answer. And now let's say hypothetically, back to my original picture, that I wanted to find the exact same points except vertically, like in the y direction, and the values are the same in terms of the three centimeters, 10. Oh, I just realized this is supposed to be millimeters, but that doesn't change any of our work, luckily, so that's good. But what I'm saying is if you only change it from the x direction to the y direction, does anything really change? The answer is no. 
all the math stays the same. The only thing that would be different is the direction. And again, if I zoom in here, remember that the electric field is going to point towards this negative charge. So that's down in every direction. In other words, negative y hat for those three in the y direction. And so that's pretty much it for this question. Believe me, I know this stuff is hard. But again, the topic is called Gauss's Law. You can find more problems online. And I'm probably going to make some more videos on Gauss's Law in the coming weeks to help you. So if you have any questions, please comment in the comments below. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care, and bye-bye.